Welcome to the Business of Hearing podcast, the podcast for high-performing hearing care clinics that want to learn the strategies, ideas, and truths behind some of the smartest private practice clinics in the world. Now, time for your hosts, Phil M. Jones and Ollie Luke. And we have some of our Inner Circle members here live in uh, in this very recording of our discussion with the brilliant Joey Coleman, who's going to be sharing some insights from his book, Never Lose a Customer Again, as well as just some of his brilliant insights across the board. And I've got to know Joey through the speaking circuit. We got to spend some great time together working in Australia earlier this year with a brilliant client uh, known as Volkswagen that some of you might have heard of. And we got to help them grow their customer experience. And I remember speaking to Joey, I'm like, the people in the world of hearing care need to understand about this methodology of never losing a customer again. And in particular, the 100 days that follow transaction. Because to me, the thing that's been really, really crazy about the world of hearing care is that for many of you, you meet a patient once, you diagnose a hearing loss, You introduce them to the fact that hearing aids are the answer for said hearing loss. You then take them through a treatment plan over a period of 7, 14, 21, 30 days, and then you ignore them for a period of time until five years go by and say, would you like to buy another set? Right. So that's what happens. And Joey, do you occur anything like this in any other industry? It's only hearing aids, only (laughs) hearing it. No, literally every industry on the planet, Phil, has the same challenge. We're really good at the chase We're kind of good at the moment of catch, but the idea of keeping long-term, we fall apart. And there's a lot of reasons we fall apart. We fall apart because of our uh, biological imperative as humans. We we like to hunt rather than farm as a general premise. Uh, We fall apart in terms of the structures of our businesses. The majority of businesses are over-indexed on behaviors that are about acquisition as opposed to behaviors about retention. And the majority of our leaders across all businesses came up through marketing and sales. It's pretty rare that the CEO of a Fortune 100 company came up through the call center on the customer service side, right? And so as a result, the tops of most organizations have this uh, overappreciation, if you will, of growing the business through more new customers, as opposed to growing the business through deeper relationships with existing customers. Got it. Now, how did you get fascinated about this stuff then? Because I know how passionate you are about customer experience and the little things that become the big things. How did that become something that Joey Coleman decided to be able to dedicate his life's work towards? Well, you know, like I think most of us, there wasn't an aha moment where all of a sudden it clicked, right? It'd be nice if I could tell a story that it was like, and then on this day, I saw the light and I realized it. But it was a sequence of events, two of which kind of stand out. Uh, First, I was reading a study about banking, which probably tells you a little bit about my social (laughs) life and my reading habits. Uh, And in reading this study, they had a statistic which blew me away, which was 32% of new bank customers who open a new banking account will close that account before the one year anniversary. And half of those people will close that account within the first 100 days. Now, Phil, I got to tell you, I was shocked, right? Because I was like, bankers pay attention to numbers. I mean, these are folks to whom the bottom, the phrase, the bottom line comes from the world of banking and accounting, right? So it blew my mind that they would spend all this money, you know, paying for new accounts, advertising, giving away free toasters to have people shutting accounts. And I don't know if you've opened a bank account recently. It's not a fun process. I mean, it can take all kinds of documentation going in, you know, four forms of identification, transferring money from old accounts, getting new checks, getting a new ATM card, PIN card, setting up direct deposit. I mean, I'm exhausted just detailing the things that are happening, (laughs) let alone doing it. And I thought, and yet double digit people, double digit percentage of your new customers who've gone through all of that process are going to leave. That was shocking to me. So that's kind of kicking along in the back of my head. Then I had this second thing happen. I had a client that worked in the home heating oil and propane space. So home services, they did air conditioners, propane, home heating oil. And we did this big campaign where we were trying to get a bunch of their customers to switch over to using propane. And we went through this whole process and we drove a ton of new signups. But then after installing propane tanks at their homes, these people were canceling their propane service. 
And the client came to me and they're like, Joey, you did your job of driving new business for us, but what's happening on the back end? And we realized that they weren't properly onboarding their customers. We put in a new plan, which is built on this first 100 days model. And not only did people stop canceling, but they started doubling down into additional services because most customers, again, across all industries, feel neglected after the sale. And if you're willing to put a little more time and effort into creating those personal and emotional connections after the sale, it makes it so much easier to sell them additional products, additional services, additional memberships, whatever your add-on upsells are. Don't, sure, try to sell them in the initial sale, but it's better if you can continue to sell them over the duration of a relationship instead of trying to get it all on the first date. And I get that. And then here's the issue that exists in hearing care is the desire to need another transaction the moment after you've transacted is not that frequent. It's not like, hey, let me get another set for the weekends or right. um, you know, let me go through this whole process again. There's another giant misconception. I'm just going to give you some of my insight from the industry is, is firstly, it takes on average seven years from somebody going, I'm finding it difficult to hear, to finally getting themselves in front of a hearing care practitioner or an audiologist and actually to, to start to do something about doing it. Or if it's my dad, it's been more than a decade now. Right. But right. That's why I, mean, average, I, I have personal seven years. Yeah, I have personal experience with this with my own father. And right. the whole family is saying, Dad, you need hearing aids. And whether he doesn't want to acknowledge or doesn't, and I don't say this being critical of dad, but I think this shows up all over and your statistic proves the point. Right, and there's that statistic. There's also a huge buying signal. Joey's dad needs some help with hearing care. He is in Iowa, whereabouts in Iowa is he? Uh, Northwestern Iowa, Fort Dodge, Iowa, little town. So if you're listening right now, want to provide a rock star service to Joey's dad, knowing that you might get some good exposure from it, I'd encourage you to be able to do something if you can get to uh, Fort Dodge, Iowa. Um, but that aside, let's give you some more context to the world of hearing care. The other thing is the industry as a whole thinks that the, um, the star of the show is the widget. So just like your dad thinks he needs hearing aids, the industry is continuing to try and sell hearing aids. And he's thinking, well, I do or I don't need hearing aids. Hearing aids aren't the thing that he actually needs. What he actually needs is help in overcoming his hearing loss, which typically needs a professional. Right. And somebody who's going to help work with them over a period of time. What happens in the world of hearing care is actually they make the purchase all about the hearing aids. They charge four, five, six, seven thousand dollars for that transaction. And then everything else that happens after the fact is hidden in this um, quote unquote follow up process. Which is a series of scheduled touch points that are rarely talked about ahead of time. They are all done for medical reasons as opposed to customer experience reasons and all missed or failed opportunities to be able to create customer retention. The irony in the hearing care space is people don't even realize they've lost a customer. Yes. Right? Yeah. Because it isn't until three, four, five years go by and they start to invite them into upgrade and realize that they've been completely ghosted. Do they think they've lost them? And they decide to themselves it's because this person died. Right. Not because they missed the opportunity. Yet the opportunity of actually working them through your process means you get them to that ultimate goal, which, which is the eighth step of all your A's, which is this advocacy piece, right? And I think actually is if we can create a process that brings us towards advocacy, then two things happen. One is you change the conversation track in Joe Public. Yes. Because which now is Joe huge. Public- It needs to happen. That's, that's the ultimate goal, right? Your token yes. goal is that Joe Public doesn't say you need hearing aids, they say you need hearing care. Right. If you can change that conversation track, then you protect this whole private expert pace part of the part of the industry. So, okay, if advocacy is the final part of your process, that's the end of the yellow brick road that we're running through, is let's just jam with you for a second to work through your eight steps of customer experience through the lens of hearing care and say that somebody who's never run a hearing care clinic before, how might we use the eight A's in your process to start thinking about things that we could add to a customer experience that mean that we are more likely to get the prize of advocacy within a hundred day period of time, as opposed to another transaction.
Sure, love it. And what I'll do, Phil, is I'll go through each of the eight phases, if that makes sense. Yep. And I'll give my best understanding as somebody who's not in the hearing care industry, <laughs> how this would map to my perceived understanding of the customer journey. You keep me honest and correct me if I misstep, but I, I feel like I've got a decent idea of where it goes. It. So the idea in this entire first 100 days concept or this never lose a customer again concept is that there are eight phases to the customer journey. Now, most businesses across all industries are paying attention to maybe three or four of them, right? And they're also paying attention to them not in the proper order. As you alluded to earlier, they're trying to get advocates, but they want to get advocates five seconds after meeting the new client. And it's like, no, no human very few humans, but pretty much no human in the history of the world has ever bought a new product or a service and that day gone out and told all of their friends, hey, look, here's what it is, unless it's something like a Tesla and they want to brag about it, right? <laughs> but the reality is I've never seen anyone go on social media and say, oh my gosh, just got my new hearing aids today. I'm super excited about them. You should go to the same place I went to. I've never seen that happen. And I think part of the reason that doesn't happen is because we're not walking them through a process, a journey. So let's talk about each of them. They all start with the letter A. The reason they do that is because if you get each of these phases right, it's the equivalent of your customer giving you straight A's on the report card. They feel you've done a great job, okay? So the first phase is the assess phase. In the assess phase, a prospective customer is trying to decide whether or not they want to do business with you. They're doing Google searches. They're looking at your social media posts. They're on your website. They might be reading blog articles. They're asking their friends who might have hearing aids. Hey, who did you get your hearing aids from? They're maybe, you know, if they're old school, they're looking in the yellow pages. I mean, there's any number of things that they're doing to try to figure out what does this landscape look like and who might be able to help me. And now we're good at that part, right? We're good at that part with everybody listening in this call, certainly our inner circle members. A chunk of our work is based on saying, whilst you're being assessed, how are you creating the evidence to make sure that your assessment comes out favorable, right? Absolutely. With Absolutely. Credibility, case studies, stories, honest communication, information about core questions that could be being asked, um, you know, transparency and trust through pricing, honest photography, like, like starting to be able to map out, assess, is, is an important phase. I'd also say that for many, certainly of our orange and gray in the circle clients is a strength, but for the industry as a whole, meh, terrible. Exactly. So I, and knowing your inner circle members, because they're working with you, I'm sure they know exactly what to say, no pun intended. They've got everything <laughs> figured out. But part of the challenge, I think every business, regardless of industry needs to acknowledge is in the assess phase, you're being compared not only to all the other brands, all the other people and their meh experience, but you're also being compared to the experiences of the best interactions they've had with any brand. Oh. So your competition isn't necessarily the other hearing care professionals in your community. Your competition is Amazon, Netflix. Yeah, Grubhub. Disney. Yeah. yeah. All the great brands that are doing an incredible job of anticipating what their customers want, providing a seamless experience, giving them a feeling when they do it, the interaction. So to me, the pro tip in the assess phase, and I agree, most folks on this call, most folks watching it probably are already doing a pretty darn good job in the assess phase. But the area where I think there's always opportunity is to give the prospect a preview of the feeling it will be like to work with you. Not the credibility, necessarily the credibility markers, the facts. Those are important. Don't get me wrong. Yep. But what's it going to feel like? Are they going to, no pun intended, feel heard, cared for, appreciated? Because when someone is coming to the table, especially in your industry, they're coming with a boatload of baggage. And the baggage they're coming to the table with is, I'm not the human I used to be. So I'm going to put you on the spot on this right now because you're in a unique set of circumstances and you don't know about the experience, but you've been thinking about this a lot on behalf of somebody you love in, in your father is you know, what feeling would you be looking to evoke in the assess phase 
as actually one of the primary decision makers in who you would choose for hearing care. Because in fact, that's interesting about this industry is often the choice is not made by the person that is going to be utilizing the product. The choice is made by somebody like you. So what are the assessment criteria that you'd be looking for? So for me personally, I'm going to want to have someone who acknowledges the blow to my father's ego that he has to now have hearing aids. Right. The, the core industry. Now, should there be a, a blow to his ego for that? Well, we could get on a therapist couch and talk about that for a decade and still not get to a good answer. But the reality is, I think the biggest hurdle and why, as you said earlier, on average, it's seven years from deciding there's an issue to taking the action is because of the ego piece of this. You know, you wear glasses. I wear contacts. I've worn contacts since I was in second grade. What I realized, even as a second grader, is I can't see. I'd like to be able to see. <laughs> I'm willing to wear glasses or, you know, contacts to solve that problem. I'm not entirely sure what the psychology is between humans not wanting to admit that they can't hear. But not being able to hear is just as bad as not being able to see. But it's more socially acceptable to wear glasses than to wear hearing aids. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that is, which is the second piece of this puzzle, is what story are they coming to the table with? My great-grandmother lived to be 107. She had hearing aids that kind of looked like almost Princess Leia-esque hearing it. Like you could see the hearing aids sticking out. I, I don't know what brand they were, but kind of the old beige plastic stuck out this far. And what I remember the most is we'd be sitting and talking to her and all of a sudden we'd hear this high-pitched squeal coming out of her hearing aid that ironically enough, she couldn't hear. But <laughs> else could really hear. And my dad or my mom or one of us grandkids, we'd be over kind of turning it down for her from this little dial to try to fix it. Now, here I am as an adult relating that story thinking, why didn't we take her back to the place where she had got her hearing aids to figure out, is the hearing aid going bad? If this is, is this a normal thing? What's going on, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the moral of the story is in the assess phase, we need to acknowledge what's going on. And from a feeling point of view, what I would suggest everybody listening is in these conversations, speak to those issues. In the first sales calls, be asking, so when did you first notice this was going bad? And why are you coming to see me today? And what past experience do you have with people with hearing aids? And is the vision of you wearing a hearing aid, what's the image of Phil with hearing aids compared to the image of Phil without? Like, what do you think? Bring some of those emotions to the table and track them. Track them in the CRM. What are their issues? What are they being, what are they concerned about coming into this conversation so that later, and we'll get to this later in the phases, you can bring those conversations back to point out that you've been listening all along. And just want to add that tracking thing, right? Is, is the industry as a whole is largely medical focused? Is there is significant requirements for tracking in, in charts and notes, et cetera? But you're talking about tracking a level of depth that is is greater than what is needed than just analyzing how their audiogram came out or what their crosses and ticks were on a checklist. You're trying to say, can I get some of that emotional criteria into the tracking information too so you can loop back on that in the journey that follows? Absolutely. I think when it comes to CRMs, and I'm sure the CRMs and the tracking tools that everybody in the inner circle and everybody watching use have certain fields where they're tracking the, the, you know, the audiogram results and they're seeing all of this stuff. I'm talking about what in most CRMs is the notes field. Right. Now, here's the thing, respectfully, most doctors across the medical industry are taught to put in little random abbreviations in the notes field that have meaning to people in their specialty, but to no one else in your team. And they're all about what's going on physically. Mm -hmm. They're not about what's going on emotionally. Okay. What I would like to see is I'm in this appointment because my family finally yelled at me enough at the dinner table that I had to come in today. I'd like to see that in the notes. I'd what, like to see what's interesting here as well, Joey, is, is the majority of people in the private, uh, private pay side of the hearing care space, this is their strength. 
like outside of the core medical model or outside of the Stackham and Rackham or the, or the cheap dispensing of hearing devices, one of the superpowers of this part of the market that we serve so well is that they give a damn, is that they care, is that they dig into those stories, is that their patients become friends. Like they know the stories that exist behind them and, and, and they're doing the work right now to plug into those emotions to be able to prove things like hearing loss doesn't mean that you're broken. It means you've lived a great life and that you plan to keep living a great life. Yes. And running campaigns around the feelings of people still being able to do things with confidence or regain confidence in doing things that they used to be able to do. And that's where the conversation track kind of comes down. So we, Absolutely. Like, and what I would say, Phil, is when we talk about running campaigns, that's great because that's getting people in. But how does the campaign continue after they've purchased? How are you continuing to remind them I'm so proud of you for getting these and coming back for your appointment because we are creating your best possible life. So let's look at this then. So we don't work and your are getting better. We're making progress. So we got all these emotional reasons out. They've assessed us, decided they wanted to do business with us. What comes next? Next is the admit phase. In the admit phase, the prospect admits that they have a problem or a need that they believe you can help them with. They sign on the dotted line, they hand over their hard earned cash, they transition from being a prospect to being a customer. Now, I'd be willing to bet that the majority of people we're talking to today are really good at this phase because this is the exciting phase for most businesses. Yeah. You got the customer, you landed the deal. Somewhere someone's ringing a bell, someone won a trip to Napa, whatever it may be, the sales numbers are coming in, we're feeling good, we've got the customer. So the only thing I'll really say is in the admit phase, what we want to do is remind the customer that we're excited that they decided to choose us. Acknowledge that it was a choice. Even if they didn't go to anyone else, say, I understand there are a lot of places you could have gotten your hearing aids and gotten your hearing care. And we're so excited that you've decided to begin this journey with us because we are committed to getting you to a point where you feel that your hearing is even better than it was when you were a kid. That's the feeling we're going for. Now, I'm sure there are plenty of medical professionals on the call who are like, well, Joey, getting it really bad, uh, it's debatable <laughs> as to whether we can do it. I get it, but I don't care what the scores are as much as I care what the feeling is. If I feel like I hear like I was 15, it doesn't matter that I'm 15 or not. Yeah. I remember putting these on and this is a new addition to me in the glasses situation. I'm like, dang, everything just got HD and 4K. I'm like, this is cool. I got supersonic sit sight and I don't. But the feeling was like from where I was to where I was is like, boom. Uh, I remember as a kid in second grade, my mom takes me to the eye doctor. We're driving home and I've got my glasses on for the first time. And I remember saying, and she tells this story that she felt heartbroken as a parent that she hadn't noticed before second grade. But I was like, signs have words on them. <laughs> like, I knew how to read, but I didn't know that billboards, I thought they were just colors right. because I had never been able to read any of the text on the billboards. And so the same thing I think applies in a hearing care scenario. Give where, us some of this, right? We got the fortunateness of, of having some real people listening to our conversation live. Give us the equivalent of signs have words on in the world of hearing care in the chat. Tell us what some of those are. And I know that, you know, I've heard a few times of, wow, I, you know, I forgot what tree sounded like. Yeah. Like, and that's magical, right? Just to catch that feeling. But for, for any of you that can contribute, give us some more of the ones that you hear on a daily basis. I'd love to be able to catch some of those and, and mount them higher. But I like I, I like what you're saying here, Joey, that what we can do is is in the admit phase, we can help set up that there is a journey. We can show gratitude towards the fact that they did have choices and that they chose you, et cetera. Is there anything else that you might do in that? to add to customer experience? What, what, what else might be a, like, what, what action can I specifically take? Yeah, well, one thing I think is important to acknowledge in the emit phase is when we make a purchase, and it doesn't matter whether it's for hearing aids, for a pack of chewing gum, for a house, our brain floods with dopamine. We feel joy, euphoria, and excitement that this is the purchase that's gonna be the answer to our prayers. This is the product or the service that is gonna help us get to the place we wanna to get to. And so our brain is filled with dopamine and we're feeling excited. I think lots of times businesses forget to acknowledge the fact that they're at the pinnacle emotionally 
in the relationship. And it's a great opportunity for you to match that emotion. So really being effusive with your excitement, really letting them know. I think lots of times we're like, well, we don't want to overly act like we're excited because then it makes it feel like we were desperate. No, let them know you're thrilled. Let them know you're excited because that's going to stand out in their buying experience. There aren't a lot of places where when you make the purchase, the people are like, yes, this is awesome. We're going to have a great time together. Who's the best in the world at this? Who have you seen that would be examples of you know, first class examples of celebrating the day that somebody becomes a customer? Oh, well, you know, one that comes to mind that some of the folks uh, may remember, and this is a little bit of a pre-COVID experience, but uh, maybe it's somewhere in your memory banks. If you go, if you've ever been to a Build-A-Bear store where they build bears for the kid, they celebrate the, the bear. They celebrate the creation of the bear. They hold it up. They cheer. They make announcements inside the store. It's a great example of somebody saying, wow, look, you just became a customer. You just brought something. And I've been in the Build-A-Bear store with my nieces and nephews and my kids. When you come back out where the kids are like, this is the best day of my life. You know, this is amazing. And there's that opportunity uh, to kind of capture that emotion. I also see Marcy, thanks so much for that chat. That's brilliant. You know, the Marcy says uh, that the patient left the office and came back complaining that the hearing aids were beeping, but it turns out the car beeped when she reversed and she had never known this. I mean, there's so many things that are just uh, the little, little pieces, even what you said, Phil, about I forgot what trees sounded. I mean, how poetic to be able to say, do you remember what trees sounded like? Would you like to know that again? Do you remember what crickets at night sounded like? Do you remember what, you know, uh, that there was a sound that matched the wind blowing on your face? You know, allowing- There's so much fun that can be done with this in ongoing copy as well, though, right? Oh. In this industry is, is there's almost a, you know, like a have you heard section that could recur through a newsletter or, you know, a footnote in a blog or a, or a, you know, a sign off in an email signature, etc. that changes in a weekly basis that is, is the latest example of like Marcy's situation there as often as we hear them. But this is the emotion piece again, right? Totally. So, well, this, I was in a framing store recently and they had the different types of glass, right? They're like, hey, do you want to buy the regular standard glass or do you want the archival amazing glass in your picture frame? And when you look at it, the archival glass looks beautiful. It's like, oh my gosh, it's so clean and crisp and clear. What is the equivalent in hearing? So imagine a video on your website that starts to play through the video and the volume is distorted or the sound isn't right. And we're seeing waves crash, but we're like, gosh, that that's a lot quieter. It's a choppier than what it would normally be. And then all the sense of the music the you know, the sound comes in and you actually hear. And that recognition that the people watching your promo materials, to your point earlier, aren't necessarily the person who's going to benefit from it. But I don't know what it's like to be my dad right now. I, I don't know how good or how bad his hearing is. I know that there are times where I have to be like, dad, can we turn the TV down? It's way too loud. Or dad, I'm talking to you. Why aren't you responding? I think there's a huge opportunity to create some empathy for the family members of the person getting the hearing aid and to turn some of our messaging and our speak to them, even if it means giving them an experience of what it's like to be dad or to be mom or to be grandma or whoever it is so that they can have a little more understanding of what their loved one is going through. Yeah, I like that. And I think the harder difference between you know, hearing loss and deafness are two completely different things. Sure. And a lot of patients, they just like, tell me all the things you didn't hear today. Like you can understand that through sight, the things are blurrier and I'm finding it difficult to oh, be no read like th these scenarios like what marcy's laid down there is patient left the office came back complaining the age were beeping turns out the car beat went reverse and then she never knew it how does that patient feel after that discovery because i'm betting that the very thing that they are then feeling is what else have i been missing yes what yeah. else and and all by themselves they relay a 15 20 25 year journey of life and build an archived library of moments that they believe they missed and nobody had to say a word, all linked to the discovery 
or even the admission of, holy crap, this was worth it. Absolutely. And here's the thing. As the people selling the hearing aids, we're going to want to believe that they're going to do that 15 years and say, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad I've arrived. Right. No, that's not what they're going to do. They're going to see it from a place of loss. Oh, my gosh, I'm such an idiot. I should have done this earlier. How many things? Are... And so their emotions are actually going to tank. And we're going to be thinking, oh, that was awesome. Look at this new thing they realized when they're going to be in a place of I'm a failure. I should have done this earlier. So I think building some messaging in early in this process where we say, look, as you discover things, be gentle with yourself. Come at it from a place of curiosity as a place of judgment for your lack of having hearing aids in the past, right? And so what are the things going on? And Jane chimes in, and I love that comment, Jane. We asked patients what their favorite sound was, and then we posted the answers all over the office, and they loved reading other people's answers. Beautiful, beautiful, because wherever we can create community within our customer base, even if they never meet the actual customer, they'll feel community in that moment. That also leads to retention because I don't want to leave my friends behind. I don't want to leave the other people that I feel like I'm part of this tribe or this group behind to either go somewhere else or what I would imagine actually happens in the world of hearing care more. It's not that they go work with another audiologist or they go work with another company. They just let this set ride until it dies. Or they so, give up on it and or they, they, the door and they don't use them. And they actually damage the reputation of the industry because what they say is, I tried hearing aids, it didn't work for me, it sucked, it wasn't worth it. Right. Which is even worse. Right. And, and I'm you, thinking about things that people can do here as well is, is this capturing of moments and Jane's example of pinning things on the wall, et cetera, is instead of it being just about your favorite sound, what happens if you start planning into your patient experience past the date that you fit them? How many moments can you collect with them over the first 100 days of them being a hearing aid wearer? Because you want a quantity of quality moments, not just their favorite, right? Their favorite was, oh, I could hear my grandchild giggle again. And you're going to get that on repeat. Yeah. But if you can get the oh, I love the sound that my four iron makes off the fairway. I forgot what that sounded like. And you get like all of these. Now you're starting to inject more emotion back into your marketing, more reaffirmation of people's smartness in their decision. And if we could start to make more hearing aid wearers feel smart that they took this decision as opposed to feel broken, this is a big step on the way too, right? Which I think is what brings us to that third step of, of affirm. Is that right? Is that what like we mean by affirmation? Yeah. So in the affirm stage, we want to affirm the choice that the customer made to work with us. So everybody who's participating today, everybody who's watching a recording here, if I were to ask you, have you heard of the phrase buyer's remorse? Raise your hand. Every hand would go up. Everyone's heard of buyer's remorse. And then if I said, do you have a system and a process in your business? to address the buyer's remorse that we scientifically know every single one of your customers is feeling, very few hands would go up. We all know it's a problem, but we think it's a problem that applies to other industries or to other customers, not to us. The research shows there's buyer's remorse even when someone buys a pack of Tic Tacs or a pack of gum at the checkout counter, like the smallest micro purchase creates a small bit of buyer's remorse because what buyer's remorse really is, is the evaporation, if you will, of the dopamine. As the dopamine recedes from the brain, those feelings of joy, euphoria, and excitement we had in the admit phase are replaced by feelings of fear and doubt and uncertainty. What if it doesn't work the way I hoped? You know, I've got a friend whose hearing aids are in the drawer. I'll probably end up like them. Or, yeah. yeah. I should have spent that money on a vacation. I should have kept that in my inheritance so it could have gone to the grandkids. I'm being selfish making this decision just for me. Or I did a good enough job to get my son or my daughter off my back. I came to the appointment, but ugh, I didn't think I needed this appointment anyway. They don't work as well as I hoped they would. Right. It's not quite worth it. Yeah, it's better, but I don't like it. Is they feel uncomfortable? Any excuse they can find. Any excuse. So in the affirm stage, we want to bring back a little bit of the marketing and a little bit of the confidence that they had coming in. 
And this is where, as I mentioned earlier, that tracking what they're experiencing, speaking directly to the things. We are excited to help you to be able to hear the sound of trees again. We are excited to be able to get to the point where it becomes so regular that you're hearing your grandchild's giggle that you don't even acknowledge internally that you're hearing it. We want to get you back to when you were a kid, you didn't necessarily walk through the world saying, oh my gosh, that's awesome that I heard that car. Oh, I love that I heard the wind. It's just taken for granted and it's okay. We'd love to get you back to where you're hearing. You can take it for granted. Now, what's interesting about that is some people might be going, well, Joey, that doesn't sound like that amazing of an experience. But here's the thing, if we get it to where they're taking their hearing for granted, if they start to lose it again, they'll come back for an appointment. If something goes wrong, they'll come back and say, well, wait a second, I'm, I'm noticing degradation of the sound. I need a checkup, I need a new hearing aid, I need something like that. It actually comes back to being part of their regular life in the same way that if your glasses weren't working as well, you'd go, well, it must be time for a new prescription. Why don't we have that sign? Even when we become so attached to our cell phones, if our cell phone starts to malfunction, then, um, then yeah. yeah. The world I mean, I've been in a situation where my cell phone isn't working and I'm like, I'm just going to get a new cell phone today because this is a tool that I need all day, every yeah. day. Let me drop everything. In fact, I'm going now, fire up the chopper. Um, exactly. I love it. I love it. So yeah, so in the affirm stage, we want to reaffirm the decision they just made. Now we move them to the activate stage. Okay, now the activate stage is once again a stage that a lot of businesses do pretty well at. This is the first real moment of truth. So in my imagining, this would be when someone comes in either for their, probably not for their first visit. Their first visit is probably going to be that admit stage. The activate stage is probably the visit where we come in and we say, okay, how's it going? Like that first check-in. And again, Phil, guide me if there's a specific I mean, name. We've done some work as well to help people understand the crafting of a patient journey. And we change language, right? Think about this simplicity of a changing language is they change the fitting, which is what they used to call it, the fitting, like everything is done in this entire thing. I change the language with everybody to let's call that first fit. Nice. And instantly that gives you a setup that there is more to be able to come. And then the second appointment for the majority of people we work with, we've relabeled real world adjustments. And this means that we can ask about what's been happening with your real world with permission to now make a second level set of adjustments around on, on these pieces. And I, I, I would say that for the majority of people that the, the buying cycle is actually really interesting in that there is a, in most states, there is a 30 day trial period, like a 30 day no risk period that is mandated upon them. So the real celebration from big part of this industry on when the sale is complete is they exhale at the end of the 30 day trial period. Sure. Like, oof, they're out of the trial, can't return them now, you're stuck with them, right? right? Like that's the window. So interestingly enough is everything that exists in that first 30 days, I would class that into the bucket of, of really a firm, right? Like that, that sits in that space there of, of affirmation is, is activate needs to come at the back end of that 30 day period or, or late or, or potentially even later than that if we want this to go the distance. Yeah. And, and I think what, what happens is so just, and again, forgive me, but so the, when I come in for the, let's pretend it's me, I'm the customer. I come in, Hey, my hearing isn't working so well. I come in for my first appointment. I presume I'm going to have a hearing test. Am I going to be fitted then? Or am I going to be fitted at another appointment? Either or depends on type of product, availability of stock, et cetera, but it could go straight into a console and fitting. It could be, well, we now know what you've wanted. We're going to order it. We'll see you again in two days, four days, five days, et cetera, either or. Make fitting and then a follow-up visit of some description that we've typically relabeled into these two pieces. Gotcha. I would I would suggest mapping. And again, this is where when I work with clients in a consulting capacity, we look at their exact sales cycle and we map it to this. And I realize there are people participating that might have slightly different models. What I would say is the admit phase is probably going to be that you know, first appointment where they come in and they get checked and things are good. Then the affirm phase is what's happening after that, when they leave the office and they're waiting to come back for that first fitting. The yep. first fitting is then the activate phase. And the reason it's the activate phase is they walk out of your office hearing differently. 
So you have activated something new in them. Now, when we come back to the real world refitting or the, you know, the second visit, that's going to be in our next phase, the acclimate phase, which lines up with the concept behind acclimate because the concept of this phase, and by the way, this is where across all industries, most industries fall apart. They do a really good job of getting the product in your hand. They do a really good job of starting to deliver the service. But once we get into what some of us might call maintenance or ongoing relationship, things fall apart. And they fall apart for a couple of reasons, but the top two of which are most businesses quit paying attention at that point because, hey, we're just into the zone. We've we've offhanded to so-and-so in the office who oversees these type of appointments, not the main person who's been the point of contact all along, or we presume that the customer is able to manage it on their own. We see this in the product world all the time where we say, hey, you got the package that you ordered from Amazon, you open it up, you plug it in, and you must be done, right? Well, if it doesn't work, do you ever go back and claim it didn't work? Or if you don't learn all the functionalities of the new thing you just purchased, are you ever going back to the directions manual and saying, you know, I've had this for about three months now. I'm not sure I'm using all the features I could be using. No, you move on with your life. So we've got this window where we really want to capitalize on the relationship. And that's the acclimate phase where we're holding the customer's hand, helping them navigate this new world that we're in. There's so much we can do in that with this industry too, in the, here's the chance where what you can do is help somebody understand how they can make remote adjustments themselves via the app on their hearing devices to help with some very specific sets of circumstances. Or here's where you can help them develop three, four, five separate programs for the core environments that they find themselves in their life so that they can start to you know, treat this as a superpower. Here's where you can help them to find some of the, you know, the custom workarounds that are circumstantial towards their giving environment, right? Is, is also it's how I guess you can acclimate them to the conversations that they're now likely to be having with other people about hearing loss, right? Because now um, they're going to have to talk about it. Right. to some people in some way. And how they choose to talk about it is going to massively impact their customer experience, right? If they are proud wearers of hearing devices, they're going to further affirm that they made the right decision. If they are doubtful or curious hearing aid wearers, then their acclimation phase is actually going to bring them right back down your series of A's to starting to be able to have some buyer's remorse. And okay, they might be outside of their 30-day period, but we've all bought things that we didn't return that we're less than satisfied with. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's the thing. Uh, Knowing about the 30 day time period, so many businesses that have a guarantee or have a return period exhale at 30 days and turn their back on the customer. Like they're just like, Oh, well, we're good. They they can't get the money back. So it kind of doesn't matter now when the reality is that's when you want to double down. Because guess who also knows the 30 days is up? The customer. They're aware of this. And their presumption because of all the other purchases they've made in their life is, well, now that the cancel period is over, I guess I just became a number. I guess I don't matter anymore. You want to blow their minds? Here's what I'd suggest. I'd suggest a call from the, the the person with the most status in your organization on day 32 that says, hey, guess what? Congratulations. It's been over 30 days now that you've been using this. Here's something I want you to know. I know we have a 30-day guarantee. Guess what? If something isn't working right, even though we're outside of the guarantee period, just let us know and we'll fix it. Let us know and we'll take care of you. Because the other belief that a lot of customers have is if they miss the return window, they've waived their right to complain or raise a flag. And you want complaints. Let me repeat that. You want complaints because the opposite of getting complaints from your customers is they quit being your customer. They leave. They go somewhere else or they decide that hearing aids aren't for them. If at any point in my relationship, you know, if somebody bought my book three years ago, and they're finally getting around to reading it today, and they're reading it, and they're like, this is ridiculous. I don't agree with anything. I want them to take me up on the money. I have a money back guarantee in my book. The money back guarantee in the book is if you read the book and it doesn't deliver at least the same amount of impact as what you paid for it, send me a message. Here's my email. My email's in the book. 
and I will personally refund the full price you paid for the book, period. I want that to be effective whenever something goes wrong because I don't want any human on the planet to be reading my book years after they purchased it saying, this book really isn't that good. No, I want them to say, hey, the book didn't work for me, but you know what was awesome? The author gave me my money back and he didn't ask for a receipt. He didn't say it had to be within the first two weeks of purchase. He just took care of me. And so while it didn't work for me, maybe it works for someone else. And I want you to catch this all everybody here as well, because here is a window that you can really win. And the reason being is all of the competition that I often hear many of you complaining about, they don't have the resource or capacity to respond to these style of complaints. Yet, if on day 115, somebody has a giant frustration with the way that the tube is fitting around the back of their ear that they just can't live with anymore, you're going to say, I've got this. Here's my big issue, though, with many of you is you do this already. You do all this stuff, but you keep it a secret and you don't invite it, which is what Joey's talking about here, is to, is, is to invite this at a greater level. That means that only a handful more deep people need to, to respond to it to then get that surprise and delight piece that then drives reputation through the wider industry. Because well, there's going to be people listening. It's like, I do that. Patient comes back after, like we see it in this industry. Patient comes back after 11 years with a hearing aid that's been discontinued that you can't get parts for, that they rummage around in drawers to find spares out of other old things and piece together like MacGyver style, some form of an adaptation just to avoid charging the patient any form, form of new money. So the levels of service are profound, but the feeling that exists within patients in the 30 to 100 day uh, window doesn't match Absolutely. the actual level of care that does exist. So how do you, how do you articulate this more than a, a phone call at day 32? What other actions could you take that, that add to this, this kind of acclimate piece? Well, what I would do in the acclimate phase is get really comfortable asking questions that guarantee a response. And I realize I'm talking to Phil Jones in this conversation, who's <laughs> all of doing this. So everybody would know that I'm trepidatious as I walk into this conversation, because I'm sure Phil is gonna take what I do and spin it into something exponentially more beautiful and effective. But here's what I like to do. I like to, with all of my clients, whether it's a consulting client or somebody you know that I'm working with on a speech, I love to come back and I say, once we're in it, when we're in the acclimate phase, when we're in the fix, I say, I, I ask one of two approaches. I either go stop, start, continue, or give me the numbers. Here's stop, start, continue. What am I doing right now that I should stop doing? You don't like it. You feel it's unnecessary. Uh, it's adding stress to your life, whatever it may be. And you got to tell me at least one. What is something I should start doing? Something that I'm not doing right now, but that if I did, you'd be like, oh, this would be amazing if you just did this one thing. And you got to tell me at least one. Last but not least, what is something that I should continue doing? What is something that I've been doing that you're loving that you may not have told me? Or you don't even necessarily have to be loving it, but it's making your life easier, making your life better. Stop, start, continue. So that's kind of one way that you could phrase the questions. The other way I like to do it is to give them a specific number. What I mean by that is I am sure there are some things that are going on right now with your hearing aid that aren't what you expected. Tell me three of them. And then you're really listening for the third one. Because mm -hmm. the first one is probably, you're probably gonna have heard before. They're gonna say, oh, well, I'm hearing things I've never heard before. And you're gonna like, yes, that's awesome. We're, our marketing materials are proving themselves. We're doing a great job. And then they'll say, oh, and the second one is, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting more comfortable using the app to set the scenarios. And you're like, oh, great, our teaching is working. I, there could be a, the third one, there's, you know, um, I'm just wondering what the future is gonna be like with the hearing aids. Whoa, grab onto that third yeah. one. What well, do you mean or Help yeah. me to understand what you mean by that. Well, I've got this trip that we've been planning to do in two years where I'm gonna be at the ocean and you live in the middle of the country right now and you never even knew that they were going to the, and they're like, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, like, can I wear these in the ocean? That conversation never would have happened had you not said, give me three, and then had the curiosity to probe that third one. 
And, you, you know, we get the opportunity to be investigators. We get yep. the opportunity to have the conversations. And it's why I'm, I'm so thrilled to, to be here today because I know, Phil, your entire methodology and way of being, even as friends interacting, is like, so tell me about this. So <laughs> about this. Oh, what might no you bad. think of this? Have you thought about what you might do for, uh, for your feet when you're sitting in that lovely chair, you know, or that kind of thing? I mean, there's these great ways that you just intersperse it into the conversation. And that's what everyone has the opportunity to do. Let's see if we can build on this together, Joey, because I really like this and I want to create something super practical that people can act on. And I'm going to mash up your two numbers <laughs> and other thing, and we're going to you know, kind of bring some dubstep to it in a way. And, and here is an exactly what to say formula that you could insert somewhere like day 32, day 35, day 41 somewhere. And I think it should come from the provider. Now, some of you are thinking that you can't do this right now, but if you're a provider that's crushing it, that means that you might be helping somewhere like 200 patients a year. That means that once a day, even taking weekends and vacations off, you could find a 10 minute window to have possibly the most important conversation in your organization. And the conversation is gonna go something like this. Question one is what three things did you like best about working with us? And I would pay particular attention to the second and th third thing. Because yeah, the first thing that they say is whatever came to mind the quickest, second and third are the most important. And you wanna make sure you keep doing those things and then you bring more of that back in to the early stages of the patient experience so people can get more of that feeling ahead of time. Second question is, if there was one thing you could change about us, what would the one thing be? And because they're giving you three pieces of good news, they're now far more likely to give you one piece of news that is less than perfect. The only way, if I may, Phil, that I would amend it, ask for two, because I want to get away from that flippant one, because the flippant one, it might be something, well, it'd be great if it was cheaper. Sure. And we're going to go, well, there's nothing I can do about making it cheaper. So I guess nothing. I don't want any conversation with a customer to end without learning at least one thing that I can practically take action on. I'm still going, though. Because I'd ask what the one thing is, and they'd tell me, and then I'd use a Michael Bungay Stania question, and I'd ask, and what else? Nice. Fair enough. Right? That would get us there. And then what I'd do is I'd draw a new line, a purposeful line with a client that says, okay, so now we're at the point where you are an accomplished hearing aid wearer. I'd actually draw a, a physical line in the conversation. What are your expectations on how best we can support you onwards from here? And ask that as a big, broad, wide open question and see where their head's at. Because my belief in this industry is they have no idea what to expect from you at that point in time. And you're going to bump into a lot of, I don't understand. Yeah. And you might get some pushback that says, well, if it breaks, you'll fix it. Like, like some form of nonchalant, like you're here if you need me, but it gives you the opportunity for you to paint out like a, oh, no, 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 here's what we really do. And actually to lay out what many of you have crafted is a Ritz-Carlton level of experience that they can expect over the years that follow. Many of you have detailed five-year treatment plans with patient journeys, with steps that like, you're going to deliver these 40 hours of like planned service and you're going to respond to all the reaction pieces and the customer doesn't know. And what we're doing is we're re-looping that affirmation point back again at the point where they thought the finish line was done. You're starting a new start line that says, ah, we now got our five-year promise to be able to deliver upon or our three-year promise to be able to deliver upon. Let's reset expectation and go again. Bill, That's I what I'll be doing there. And I'd be, I'd be willing to... I'd be willing to bet that even for the Ritz Carlton, we have the five-year plan where you've put that in paper in front of the patient, like they've gotten a hand out of it. They've forgotten. They weren't listening because they, they were, were still listening. like in all the emotional stuff. Exactly. They just they weren't paying attention. And what, you know, I, I often think about this in the context of uh, university. When somebody goes to college or they go to university as a freshman, their first day, it's been ingrained in them that this is going to be a minimum of a four year process. And each one is going to build on the previous years. So what can we do to let them know that this isn't like your eye doctor where 
you're going to go for, you know, maybe it is like the eye doctor where we want you to come for an annual checkup, but a lot of people skip their annual checkup with their eye doctor because they're like, well, the glasses are still working. So why do I need to go to a checkup? Same with dentists. I work with a lot of dentists and dentists are like, oh my gosh, if people would just come for a cleaning every six months, we'd have a fraction of the issues we have. But people go, well, my teeth aren't hurting. I don't need to clean. I'm busy. I'll reschedule it, push it, push it, push it. And next thing you know, it's a year later. I think it's useful for folks in the hearing care industry to think about what are the proxies that your patients are comparing themselves to. And I'd be willing to bet that there are three. They're comparing you to eye doctors. They're comparing you to the physical doctors that they go see. So a, a medical professional, you know, where it's like, I only go see if I'm not feeling well, right? And then uh, they're dentist. And that's probably the third one that they're comparing you to. I say this respectfully, dentist, eye doctors, and general practitioners in the medical field aren't necessarily the most stellar reputations for patient experience, right? So if they're comparing you to other people that kind of have a lower bar for care, that don't have built-in systems the way you do, I might suggest that say, look, I want you to think of this like, and ask them in the early process, tell me about your life. Where did you go to school? Did you go to college? What was it like? And if they didn't go to college, but they went to high school, oh, you went to high school. Did you, were you at the same high school for all four years? Oh, great. Because now we have a reference point that we can come back to and we say, great. So your hearings are in, we've completed freshman year. I'd love to make sure you graduate sophomore year. Here's the thing in sophomore year, we're going to expect that the basic aspects of knowledge you've got down. We're going to start to teach you more situational things. So we're going to want you to be able to tweak the app on a moment's notice. We're going to want you to be paying attention to this and that. Oh, junior year? Oh, that's coming. That's three years from now, but that's coming. And here's what we're going to be doing then that year. And by the way, in junior year, we want you to start thinking about college. College? What's college in the hearing aid scenario? Well, let me tell you. And now you're saying this is a long-term relationship, not a transactional relationship. Love it. I really love that. And the metaphor versus college or, or high school or anything else that might even suit uh, suit your business. And we have you know, some businesses that have a purely mobile offering is, is you could start to align that to, to how somebody would go through like their driving test and then they would get their first car and like, like you can be playful inside your brand with this, right? Is to be able to actually create a four-year journey that has a parallel to a four-year journey that they already know. Joey, we've got three more phases to talk through. We've got 15 minutes to be able to do it. I want to make sure that we get through them because what we have is we've assessed. Um, what we've done is we've audited, we've affirmed, we've activated, we've acclimated. We've got three more to go. Where do we go next? Let's do rapid phase through these. So the first one, uh, which is actually, you know, we're coming up here on uh, step number six in this eight step process is the accomplish phase. The accomplish phase is the finish line, the goal that every prospect has before they even do business with you. It's whether or not they achieve it. Now, here's my assumption. And I say this respectfully, because I don't know everybody on the call, but I'd be willing to bet that the most people on the call feel that the accomplished phase is when the person can hear. Because the reason they wanted hearing aids is because they couldn't hear, so they're hoping to hear. It's deeper than that. They want to hear without having to think about it. They want to hear all the things. They want to hear in every environment, but it might also be something that's more emotional that has nothing to do with hearing. They want to got, not get yelled at by their kids. They want to not feel embarrassed when they ask someone to turn up the TV. They want to do things that are related to the hearing, but it's a more specific thing. The analogy I often like to use is the wedding dress. Most people who sell wedding dresses presume that the accomplished phase is the wedding day. When the bride wears the wedding dress, no, not at all. And Phil, I know you know this because we've talked about this. The accomplished phase is when they get the photos and the video back from the wedding and they look beautiful in the dress. So wedding dress makers should be sh selling for the photos, not selling for the wedding day. Same with hearing aids. Don't sell for the I hear better because guess what? They'll probably experience that. They should experience that right after the first fitting. They should go out to the world and be like, oh my gosh, I'm hearing better. And if they've made the accomplished line there, all of your three-year plan, your five-year plan feels extraneous to them and unnecessary. 
we want them to see all those subsequent things as being part of the journey. So that's the accomplish phase. And when they reach this point, and it's why we want to track it in the CRM, what are they really trying to accomplish? We want to celebrate with them because most humans are horrible at celebrating their own accomplishments. They're pretty good at celebrating the accomplishments of others. They're not really good at celebrating their own progress and their own accomplishments. And it's our opportunity to track their progress and really acknowledge and celebrate when they get there. And if I'm to try and stick a capstone on what that goal would be for everybody in this industry, it's to be able to evidence that they now have confidence in a quantity of quality scenarios and at least one specific scenario that mattered to them, them, and only them. So that's confidence in a quantity of quality scenarios and at least one specific that matters to them, them, and only them. And if you can reach that goal, you've probably accomplished the mission that was worthy of them agreeing to part with the sum of money that they agreed to part with on day one. Yeah. And, you know, when we think about how do we tag the, uh, the quantity of quality experiences, What about saying to the patient on that second appointment when they come in that used to be the refitting, but now is kind of the real world adjustment, right? We said, hey, here's the thing. Will you do me a favor? For the next two weeks, every time you hear something new, just send a quick text message. (laughs) Oh, I, I, I just heard the swing of my four iron. Oh, I just heard my grandson's cell phone ring in the back of the house. And I've never heard that before. It doesn't have to be these earth shattering things, but get them recording these things. So when you come to those appointments, you can say, well, here's the things you shared, this and this and this and this that you heard. Wow, we're really starting to amass a lot of things that you were missing before that you're now catching. And if for any reason you think that the text message you know, might be beyond the capacities of some of your patients, but you feel that it needs to be a little more retro and old school than that. Is there, you know, is there a prop that you can give them at this point with a little pencil attached to it that fits in a purse or a pocket that allows them to be out of job? And yeah, bring, down bring, a your little, bring your little hearing journal where right. you've recorded. And, and I can imagine something that it's a small little journal with a pen that yeah. on the font says new sounds. Yep. And you open it up and Write down all the new sounds you hear and bring it to your next appointment because we'd love to review it with you and see what you've done. And throw them a challenge is, you know, last month, I think the most new sounds that somebody reported to me was 21. So let's see how you get on, right? Is something real, throw them a challenge and give them something to make it playful and gamify to touch. We then come to the next phase, phase seven, right? The adopt phase. The adopt phase is when the customer becomes loyal to you and only you. They're not going to go anywhere else. They have bought into your methodology. They bought into your approach. They're going to continue to come for their regular appointments over the next three to five years. The reason ADOPT is its own special phase is because these are your most loyal and committed customers. These are the people that will pay to upgrade their hearing aids five years from now, 10 years from now, because they built such a long-term relationship with you. Everyone on the planet is living longer. So guess what? they're going to need additional product and service help from you in the future. We want to acknowledge, though, that transition from somebody being a customer to being an adopter, where we don't have to remind them as much to come to the visits, where they're proactively calling to schedule an annual checkup or come in. They're doing things that are signals to us that they're adopters. We want to acknowledge how valuable they are to the business, because then we get the chance to flip them to the final phase, phase eight, the advocate phase, where they become a raving fan singing our praises far and wide. Now, a lot of businesses, Phil, look at advocacy as people that give referrals. And that's true. People who give referrals are advocates. But in this modern era, you know what also is a sign of advocacy? Someone sitting at their conversation with their other golf buddies saying, gosh, I hear better than I've ever heard before. Even if they don't say, let me take you over to Phil and he'll get you here. Them speaking positively is an advocate moment. They're posting on social media is an advocate moment. Now I get some of your customers are like social media. What are all the kids doing? But the fastest growing percentage of people on Facebook is people over 65. Right. The sweet spot for the hearing care community, right? So there's an opportunity to acknowledge those moments of advocacy 
One of the things I try to do is when somebody advocates or promotes me online, I jump in and I chime in, oh, thank you so much. But wherever possible, I try to follow up with a handwritten thank you note to their house. Why? I want to take it out of the channel of communication they made the acknowledgement in to give them something that's physical and tangible. So if it's a digital recognition of me, I try to give them an analog paper acknowledgement that I saw the digital. And what it does is it just completes the loop for them that they did something nice for you, you acknowledged it or did something nice for them. Guess what as humans we do then? We do more of it. Yeah. When a behavior is rewarded, our biology says, I'm going to do that again. And that's where I think most businesses completely miss out on referrals. I had a client that we were working with recently that uh, made a referral and it led to a million dollars of new business for the other company. The other company sent him a thank you card, which was great, with a $15 Starbucks gift card. <laughs> Now, this was a million dollar piece of business. I'm not saying they had to send them a check for $100,000 or $10,000, but don't send a $15 gift card. Send something that is commensurate with the value of the advocacy. And it doesn't have to be money, but it needs to be something that acknowledges the significance with which the referral was made. Yeah. And I'm thinking about those last two phases and, and my little voice always says, yeah, but how? Yeah, but how? And like, I'm thinking for the industry as a whole, and I'm still puzzled a little on the yeah, but how? So how do we move somebody into that adopt phase in the world of hearing care? Where does that come? Is that day 90? Is it year three? Like, where is it? And how do you create a catalyst for it? Or how do you plan something into your patient experiences that increases your chances? of being able to get somebody to, to move from being, I'm a happy customer to I'm now yours, yours, and only yours. And then I'm prepared to be able to shout to the world about it. Right. Ow. Well, two thoughts to that. Number one, adoption. All the, the other phases, we can lots of times track to a specific calendar time when they're going to happen. Some people are going to become adopters in the first hundred days. Some people aren't going to become adopters till year three. And that's okay. But to the second question, we need to be ready to observe the adoption signals and respond accordingly. So a couple signals that could be adoption. Uh, as I mentioned before, they're scheduling their appointments or coming to their appointments without you needing to tell them. They're reaching out proactively to tell you, hey, uh, I'd like to get an appointment because I'd like to talk X, Y, Z, or I'm calling in just to ask a question. Like I imagine with a lot of places, they call in to ask a question off schedule. Or here's another thing that might be a great clue is that they are telling you what somebody else in the industry is up to. Mm, yes. So they are bringing you somebody else's direct mail piece or they are sharing with you that they read something uh, you know, about the wider industry online and they're bringing that to you is that they are, they are feeling a duty of responsibility to let you know what they know or that they found out in the industry. Absolutely. So the reason I call it adopt and the analogy I want people to think of is adopting a child. When we adopt a child, we're responsible for looking out for them. In the adopt phase, it feels like the role shifts. The customer starts to act like they care about us. In all the previous stages, we're showing the customer that we care. In the adopt phase, we start to see signals that they care about us. So I'm guessing everybody listening right now has got on the top of their head at least a handful of people that exist in their organization are like, yes, they've adopted me. Like, like the, the, they might not have seen it so clearly as how you've mapped it out. They've got people that fit this category. What might you do with that group of people right now? What might be some actions or steps that you could take with them that moves them towards advocacy? Well, recognizing that we potentially have folks uh, all over the world that are participating in this, what comes to mind for me is we're here in the United States, we're in November. This is the season of Thanksgiving, right? And a genuine acknowledgement of how thankful you are for their continued support and participation with you, their continued relationship. Now, the way this usually shows up is a standard typed letter that gets sent out to all of the patients. 
please don't do that. Just stop. Just stop doing that. It, it costs you so much more than the financial cost of doing it because people get it and they're like, wow, great. Must be Thanksgiving. And they had to send the adoption, you know, thanks for being a customer letter. What I would rather see are things like a personal video that you send them where you just shoot it to a one to two minute video. Hey, we've been working together, Phil, for three years from now. Gosh, I remember your first appointment when you told me you were gonna be going to the beach and you were hoping to be able to hear the kids on the beach and find a waterproof hearing aid. And that was something you were, it was important to you and we were trying to figure out what that would look like. And here we are three years later and you've been to the beach a dozen times. I just gotta tell you, I am so excited that you decided to be in relationship with us. I am so thankful for our ongoing friendship. I'm so thankful that you continue to work with us to make sure your hearing is fantastic. And in the season of thanks, I just wanted to let you know you're appreciated. Thanks for all you do. I look forward to seeing you soon. Straightforward, simple, not complex. The other thing you can do in the adopt phase is to think about a gift. Think about actually giving them a gift or a present. Uh, and what I want to do when it comes to a gift or a present, and Phil's heard me rant about this before. Folks, I say this respectfully, if it has your logo on it, it's not a gift or a present, okay? It's a marketing tool. I'm not opposed to doing promo items, but that's not a gift. A gift is something that when the recipient receives it, they say, wow, the person who gave this to me knows me better than I know myself. Or the person who gave this to me was paying attention when I was talking. Years ago, I had a, a, our first son was born. He's seven now, but he was born. And a guy that I knew who had heard me speak sent me some Notre Dame onesies, some little onesies for the baby with the Notre Dame logo on them. Now, he had heard me speak and heard me mention that I went to Notre Dame and figured, I bet Joey will appreciate this. I was blown away. I was like, not only did I appreciate it, but I started singing this guy's praises far and wide. I was all about him and his business and what he was doing because I was like, he cared about me. So of course, reciprocity says I should care about him. So what is the little gift? And it doesn't have to be an expensive gift, but something that you can give them that says, I'm caring about you. Let's say they come in and they say, um, you know, my, uh, my daughter's about to have her first baby. Maybe the gift is, a gift for the child, for the grandchild, the first grandchild, or something like that. It's acknowledging that I'm paying attention to go, what's going on in your life, and I want to reward or you know mark this milestone accordingly. So it's the thought that counts. Always. Always. Joey, we're bringing it around to the end of our time together today. I do want to capture any comments from anybody who had the ability to show up live. So if you have any comments, a quick rapid fire question, some form of contribution to show your gratitude towards Joey sharing some of his experience with us today, then I'd appreciate seeing that in the chat. So thank you. Thank you. Joey, where can people find out more about you? Where can they uh, learn more about some of your methodology? Sure. So the best place to find me is on my website. It's joeycoleman.com, J-O-E-Y, like a baby kangaroo or a five-year-old, you know, uh, Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N, like the camping equipment, joeycoleman.com. There's videos there. There's articles. There's things for folks. The book is called Never Lose a Customer Again. And in the book, which thanks for having a prop in the background there, Phil, so nice. Uh, in the book, we outline the eight phases and there are 46 case studies from companies small, medium, and large, online and offline, product and service, domestic and international. The whole idea was to fill your brain with creative ways you can use what I identify as the six communication tools to create these kinds of remarkable experiences for your customers. So in-person interactions, physical mail, snail mail, emails that actually get read and acted on, uh, phone, whether that's for texting or actually calling people, videos, and presence. And so if folks want to explore this more, I do do some consulting. As you know, I do speaking, but uh, just happy to have people take some of these ideas and put them into practice into their business. And if you do, if anything we've talked about today leads you to make something or create a communication, please, please, please let me know. I'm always looking for case study examples to share with my audiences and in my books. So uh, I just appreciate everybody spending some time because I, I think this is an incredibly important industry. When Phil asked me to do this, there was zero hesitation on my part for two reasons. Number one, Phil's an amazing human and I'd do anything for him. But number two, I think your industry is one of the most misunderstood, underappreciated industries on the planet. 
And it drives me crazy because I've experienced in my own life loved ones who have not sought out the solution that I know is there because of the stigma associated with it, or because of their lack of understanding of how it works, or because of their fear of this gigantic expense. I will tell you, I've had people tell me, I'd love to get hearing aids, but I don't have $30,000 to spend. <laughs> and I've said to them, I, I don't think that's how expensive hearing aids are. And they're like, oh, they're really expensive. And I was like, have you actually gone and checked? And they're like, no, it's, somebody told me it was $30,000. And I'm like, I guarantee there are solutions that are less than $30,000 for you. So anything I can do to help all of you to, you know, change the stigma, especially here in North America on wearing a hearing aid, I would love to do because man, I love being able to hear and I wish everybody could. Joey, thank you so, so much. And even for your insight and customization and, and applying your wisdom towards the industry. I will tell everybody, I'm a huge advocate for Joey's work. Joey's book is one of the most gifted books that I share with other people. Um, is I would invite you that, yes, if you've enjoyed the book, do the standard things, leave the reviews. They do go a long way for authors. But as you start to think about the other small business owners and business leaders that you have in your social circle, Think for a second if they could benefit from some of Joey's methodology and maybe a little something you could do for them, Joey and everybody else is to pass on a copy of the book to them as a small token of appreciation so that they find ways of being able to stand out. Because my goal for 2021 and onwards is to help the independent businesses really start to be able to fight back versus some of the big guys. And I do think that the window of opportunity that we live in right now is the best opportunity that will exist in our lifetimes to be able to do so. And the little touches that Joey's mentioned that, that, that are the how behind the what. Yeah, I would say in this era where we are being encouraged to practice social distancing, which turns into physical distancing, where we're not seeing people as much as we would like to or interact with, the opportunity to create personal touch, personal communications, these little moments of connection People are so hungry for this. They are thirsting for it. And it is the way that the independent businesses will run circles around the big businesses all day long. They can't even begin to get enough people in the room to have a meeting about how they would do this, as opposed to a small business coming in and saying, hey, we're going to make changes starting today. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start connecting in different ways. Your customers are thirsty for this. And I promise you, promise you, they will respond and they will respond in ways you can't even begin to imagine. Joey, I appreciate you, my friend. Look forward to connecting with you again real soon. See some of the love for you in the chat here as well. And I'm looking forward to sharing you with the rest of the world when this goes out in the podcast, seeing some high fives kicking in here too. Oh, I love it. Thanks, friends. Really appreciate your chiming in and staying with us for the conversation today. And thanks for having me, Phil. Always a pleasure. Pleasure, my friend. Thanks so much. Take care. And Bye-bye. there we have it. That is a wrap. Thank you so much for listening to the Business of Hearing podcast. Make sure you subscribe to be the first to know when a new episode goes live. If you're feeling kind enough to share your experience and leave us a five-star review, it would mean the world to us. And if you want to learn more, then go to www.orange-gray.com for article guides and training specifically written for high-performing hearing care businesses. We look forward to speaking to you again soon.